The silver shoes, said the good witch, have wonderful powers, and one of the most curious things about them is that they carry, can carry you to any place in the world in three steps, and each step will be made in the wink of an eye. All you have to do is to knock the heels together three times and command the shoes to carry you wherever you wish to go. If that is so, said the child joyfully, I will ask them to carry me back to Kansas at once. She threw her arms around the lion's neck and kissed him, patting his big head tenderly. Then she kissed the tin woodman, who was weeping in a way most dangerous to his joints. But she hugged the soft, stuffed body of the scarecrow in her arms instead of kissing his painted face, and found she was crying herself at the sorrowful parting from her loving comrades. Glinda the Good stepped down from her ruby throne to give the little girl a goodbye kiss, and Dorothy thanked her for all the kindness she had shown to her friends and herself. Dorothy now took Toto up solemnly in her arms, and having said one last goodbye, she chained, clapped the heels of her shoes together three times, saying, take me home to Aunt Em. Instantly, she was whirling through the air so swiftly that all she could see or feel was the wind whistling past her ears. The silver shoes took but three steps, and then she stopped so suddenly that she rolled over upon the grass several times before she knew where she was. At length, however, she sat up. Good gracious, she cried, for she was sitting on the broad Kansas prairie, and just before her was the new farmhouse Uncle Henry built after the cyclone had carried away the old one. Uncle Henry was milking the cows in the barnyard, and Toto had jumped out of her arms and was running toward, the bar toward him, barking joyously. Dorothy stood up and found she was in her stocking feet, for the silver shoes had fallen off in the fight through the air and were lost forever in the desert. In 1900, just 35 years after Alice's Adventures in Wonderland was published in London, America's own favorite fairy tale, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, was published in Chicago. Superficially, the tales resemble each other. Each recounts the strange adventures of a small but determined little girl traveling through a land of many wonders. Characters encountered by the little girls are striking and often memorable, but where Alice awakes to discover that her adventures were part of an afternoon dream, Dorothy actually traveled to Oz, returning to Kansas through the magic of a pair of silver shoes, which she has lost in transit from Oz to America, arriving in her stocking feet, as we just saw. Lewis Carroll created only one major Alice book beyond Alice's adventures, Through the Looking Glass, and what Alice found there, while L. Frank Baum ultimately wrote 13 additional novels about Oz, founding an extended fantasy series that continued through six additional authors, culminating in 1963 with the 40th book. Interestingly, both authors were over 30 when their most famous books were published. Both were much involved in the design and illustration of their works. Both invested their own personal funds to support their projects to help assure that their books were strikingly handsome in their makeup. And both were striving to produce books that would entertain young readers rather than preach to them. Indeed, there is an additional parallel that reflects the author's concerns for the presentation of their books. Because of mediocre printing, Lewis Carroll, on the urging of his illustrator, John Tenniel, blocked the distribution in England of the first printed edition of Alice before it was actually released there. In Chicago, after its initial printing, Wizard's uh, co complex printing plates were taken offline and completely reworked to provide better placement of the many two-color text illustrations to correct their typogra three typographical errors and to improve the appearance of the inserted color plates. L. Frank Baum was just nine years old when Alice's Adventures in Wonderland was published. The 1866 American issue of the original English sheets by Appleton in New York apparently sold somewhat slowly, and the first American printed edition did not appear until 1869 when it was published in Boston by Leon Shepard. Whether any of those early versions was available to Baum in his youth remains unknown. But 
By the time he began writing for children, he certainly knew of the Alice books, just as he was familiar with the fairy tales of Hans Christian Andersen and the folk tales collected by Wilhelm and Jakob Grimm. From a literary standpoint, the author of The Wonderful Wizard of Oz was a late bloomer, already 44 when Wizard was published. Baum was born in 1856 in a small village called Chittenango near Syracuse, New York. His father was comfortably well off during Baum's youth, maintaining his family on a country estate called Roseland, just north of Syracuse. Young Baum was largely educated by private tutors with an unhappy period of time at the Peak School Military Academy near New York City. Home again in his teens, Baum collected stamps, raised a colorful breed of chickens known as Hamburgs, and developed early skill in typesetting and printing on a hobby press that was the equivalent of presses used by small town newspapers. In his early 20s, he became enamored of the theater and in 1882 even had moderate success with a musical play for which he wrote the book, composed the music, and created the lyrics, The Maid of Aaron. That same year, he met and married the love of his life, Maud Gage, who had been a student at Cornell University and was the daughter of Matilda Jocelyn Gage, a major leader of the women's suffrage movement in America. Just six years after his marriage, his father's business failed and Baum decided to strike out with his wife and their two sons to Aberdeen, Dakota Territory. There he established a fancy goods store that he called Baum's Bazaar. Period newspaper advertising reveals that he was an imaginative and vigorous promoter of his wares. Unfortunately, a regional land recession led to failure of the store in 1890, and Baum then took over a weekly newspaper, which he renamed the Aberdeen Saturday Pioneer. As the recession continued, Baum found that he could not sustain the newspaper, and in 1891, now with a wife and four young sons to care for, he traveled to Chicago for work, moving his family to join him once he was settled. He initially worked as a journalist, but soon get, began traveling for a wholesale dealer in fine crockery and crystal. Seemingly, in his travels, he found that his sense of style and experience in display of merchandise, remember Baum's Bazaar, resonated with shopkeepers. By the mid-1890s, Baum, exploring enterprises that might permit him to stop his continual traveling, copyrighted two titles for children, in 1896, Adventures in Funnyland and Tales from Mother Goose. In Chicago, he had joined several prominent clubs, and at the press club, he befriended, a, he befriended a young publisher, Chauncey Williams, who was with Irving Way, a founder of a small publishing house devoted to producing well-designed books. These strongly reflected the arts and crafts typographic movement fostered originally by William Morris at the Comscock Press in England, and the closely allied aesthetic movement that promoted a somewhat cleaner, lighter sense of graphic design. Indeed, Way and Williams have the distinction of being the only American co-publisher of a book designed and printed at the Comscock Press. In 1897, Williams undertook two projects for Baum. The first was the publication of Mother Goose in Prose for which Williams commissioned a young artist, Maxfield Parrish, as illustrator. The strikingly handsome book, a large quarto in format, was, first, and it was a first for both author and artist. At virtually the same time, Williams also became publisher of an innovative monthly journal founded by Baum, The Show Window, a technical magazine focused on merchandising display, the first number of which was dated November 1st, 1897. Baum was not only the editor, but was also a major contributor of articles about merchandising, window, and store display. In 1898, Baum, now fully occupied with the show window, took time to produce a small book of his own verse, setting the type by hand. This modest, by the candle uh, volume, modest, by the candle of his glare, reflecting the arts and crafts design was limited to just 99 copies. Friends contributed some of the materials for the book, including its 14 original black and white illustrations. Three of the artists later illustrated additional books by Baum. Baum not only designed and printed the book, but he also bound most of the copies by hand. In 1899, one of those illustrators joined Baum in producing Father Goose, his book. This book of Baum's nonsense verse 
they conceived of as being printed in colors throughout in an era when most American children's books were still illustrated in black and white, Father Goose was a noteworthy innovation, and it became the best-selling American children's book of 1899. With a new outlet for his talents before him, Baum quickly produced additional children's books for 1900. The most elaborate, and intentionally so, was The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, a full-length fantasy novel lavishly illustrated by W. W. Denslow, the text illustrations were printed in two colors throughout in the colors corresponding to the themes within the story as it evolved. There were, in addition, 24 inserted color plates printed in four colors on enameled paper. Baum's Chicago publisher was delighted to be able to produce additional work from his pen in 1900. A selection of Father Goose rhymes was set to music by Alberta N. Hall, Songs of Father Goose, and two oversized alphabet books were produced, the Army Alphabet and the Navy Alphabet. These two volumes had color illustrations by Harry Kennedy and, like Father Goose, were hand-lettered. This was the era of the poster and the arts and crafts book, after all, by Charles J. Costello, who had also contributed, uh, contributed an illustration to Baum's 1898 first book, A New Wonderland, The Magical Monarch of Moe. One of the significant gaps in literary documentation of American letters is the manuscript archive of L. Frank Baum. While his published work stands on its own merits, Baum scholars would have welcomed the additional insights that correspondence and manuscript texts might offer. Only three book-length manuscripts of his original works of fantasy survive. These are for the last three Oz books he wrote, two of them published posthumously. Fortunately, two are at the University of Texas and available, and the third one was given to the Library of Congress by the family of L. Frank Baum in the year 2000, the centennial of Wizard of Oz. But there are important secondary records that give at least a sense of what his early efforts at writing books for children entailed. A telling inscription in Baum's own copy of A New Wonderland reveals a number of significant details. I intended this book to be dedicated to my four boys, but by error, the dedication was omitted. The boys heard most of the stories told before I wrote them down. This book was received by me on October 8th, 1900, although the date of publication was announced for September 20th. Mr. Russell tells me he has printed 10,000 as a first edition. I like the illustrations more than those in any of my other books to, up to the present time and consider the book as a whole very pretty. Written in 1896, it was the first children's book I ever wrote, but was not offered for publication until Mother Goose and Prose appeared. Then, Way and Williams accepted it, but failed, 1898, the year it was to be published, and the manuscript was transferred to H.S. Stone and Company, who agreed to bring it out in the fall of 1898, but let it drag until too late in uh, the year to secure a proper illustrator. I then took the manuscript away from them, and in the summer of 1899, sent it to Russell. He accepted it too late for publication that year, so it was not insist, uh, issued until now. Mrs. Gage liked these stories. The book has had good advance notices. I hope it will sell. Now, as we have just learned from Baum himself, as he was still keeping his options open and had submitted his text for te Adventures in Funnyland to another major American arts and crafts publisher, R.H. Russell of New York, Russell selected Frank Verbeck as illustrator, and the free-flowing style, eccentric use of color, and broad humor evidently appealed to Baum. Baum's comment on the illustrations in the inscription we heard earlier may reflect a growing tension between him and Denslow. Their last full collaboration was Dot and Todd of Maryland, a full-length, lavishly illustrated book published by Baum, a Chicago publisher, in 1901. The title, Adventures in Funnyland, already reminiscent of Adventures in Wonderland, was changed to a new Wonderland before the book went to press. There is little doubt that Baum and the publisher were hoping to capitalize on the popularity of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. To a, to a 21st century viewer, the Verbeck drawings look surprisingly fresh. They have broad humor, something we know Baum appreciated in his illustrators, lively lines, and a flowing, almost Art Nouveau style. We can believe Baum's statement that he preferred Verbeck over that of his other illustrators, who had included Maxwell Parrish, Denslow, and Harry Kennedy. 
Although Russell did not reprint the book, the later life of A New Wonderland warrants a brief summary. In 1903, Bob's Murrow published the text somewhat revised as The Surprising Adventures of the Magical Monarch of Mo and His People, shortened on the binding to simply The Magical Monarch of Mo, which resembled the alliterative title of The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. The Verbeck illustrations were reworked and recolored. Curiously, a sizable number of border illustrations by Verbeck, not used in the original R.H. Russell edition, were first introduced in the Bob's Morrill edition. We, don't, we won't dwell on them individually, but we'll scan them. I think they make it worth seeking an early edition of the magical monarch of Mo. Mo was reprinted in 1913 by M.A. Donahue of Chicago using the Bob's Murrell printing plates. Bob's reprinted the book several times in subsequent years in a less ornate binding after 1915. Finally, in 1947, Bob's published a new edition with illustrations by Evelyn Kopelman, who had created fresh illustrations for The Wizard of Oz in 1944. In 1968, Dover published a new edition with a fine introduction by our own Martin Gardner. And I say our own, meaning both the Lewis Carroll Society and the International Wizard of Oz Club, because he was instrumental in the early years of both. This paperback, reprinted by uh, the Bob's Merrill text, so it does have these border illustrations that I'm showing you. This, will, this little slide here is the original 1900 version. This is how it was recolored by Bob Merrill, but used the original color scheme of the color plates in a new underland. So when you get the Nova version, you do have the 1900 version of the color plates. Quoting from Martin Gardner's introduction to the Dover edition of the Magical Monarch of Mo. There are several respects in which the magical monarch of Mo differs in emphasis from Baum's Oz books and his later fantasies. First of all, it is richer in humor of the Carolian variety, humor that exploits outrageous log logical impossibilities. An apple on a high branch is inaccessible because the tree's trunk has been sawed off from the branch and the trees uh, chopped up for kindling wood. A wizard has morning office hours from 10.45 to a quarter to 11. Perhaps it was this Carolian nonsense that led Baum in the first book title to speak of Mo as a new wonderland. Please join me now for a quick wander through L. Frank Baum's A New Wonderland. Baum aficionados in the room will undoubtedly catch a number of details that prefigure later elements in the Oz books. These are the Kopelman illustrations shown very quickly. The book was definitely highly ornamental. It was a large quarto. It had two bindings. The original binding was the boards one that I showed you initially. The later issue of the sheets was done in a cloth binding, which you just saw. The end papers were in the hardbound boards version, but were uh, lost, or they ran out of them by the time the cloth binding went into place. But this is the end paper design. And then I'm just going to go on without too much individual comment, but you will see the style of the 1900 book with very elegant half titles, chapter heads, and so forth. The book included 16 inserted color plates on much thicker glossy stock, although the book itself was printed on glossy stock. And the title page itself was an insert. So let us shoulder the burden of the book and move forward. The Valley of Funnyland, a dentist's delight, I fear. Everything they can possibly need grows on trees, so they have no use of money. Though there are no pe poor people in Funnyland. One river flows milk of a very rich quality. Some of the islands are made of excellent cheese. In the little pool, uh, pools there near the bank, delicious cream rises to the top. Instead of water lilies, great strawberry leaves grow upon the surface, and the ripe red berries lie dipping in the cream. The sand of the river bank is pure white sugar and all kinds of candies and bonbons grow thick upon the low branches. The people are merry, lighthearted folk who live in beautiful houses of pure crystal where they go in when it rains. It only rains lemonade. 
The lightning in the sky resembles the most beautiful fireworks, and the thunder is usually a chorus from the opera of Tannhäuser. The king's head and the purple dragon. Behold, a headless wonder. The purple dragon has bitten off the king's head and swallowed it. Gives him indigestion, he spits it up later, which leaves the king at a significant disadvantage. But the king is quite philosophical. Never mind, said the king cheerfully. I can get along very well without a head, and as a matter of fact, the loss has his advantages. I shall not be obliged to brush my hair, or clean my teeth, or wash my ears. So do not grieve, I beg of you, but be happy and joyful as you were before, which showed the king had a good heart, and after all, a good heart is better than a head any day. <laughs> but we are not out of, the, out of the woods yet. The headless king asks a woodchopper to create a wooden head to place on his shoulders. However, the queen does not care to kiss the wooden head. And later, when the king's original head is placed on the woodchopper's shoulders by the mischievous purple dragon, the queen wisely suggests that the two men exchange heads. Although the king has promised the hand of one of his daughters to the woodchopper, now that the chopper has a wooden head, all have refused. Indeed, when the king comes to think, look carefully at the wooden head, he does not blame his daughters for not wishing to marry it. He wisely concludes that should he force one of them to consent, it is not unlikely she would call her husband a blockhead, a term almost certain to cause trouble in any family. How the king lost his temper. Watch your step. When the king encounters a dog visiting from a distant land, we learn that Funnyland has never seen such a creature. The king is intrigued that the dog walks on four feet and asks why he has that many. Because six would be too many, replied the dog. But I only have two, said the king. I am sorry, said the dog, who was something of a wag. Because where I come from, it is more fashionable to walk upon four feet. Whereupon, the king decides to walk on hands and knees until it becomes uncomfortable. The dog becomes increasingly amused as the king loses his temper over his discomfort. Finally, exclaiming to the king, see how foolish a man becomes who tries to be in fashion rather than live in nature as nature intended he should? You can no more be a dog than I a king. So hereafter, I, if you are wise, you will, will, you will be content to walk upon two legs. The burlesque continues. After dinner, the king invites the dog to take a walk around the grounds of the royal mansion. But the king's boots begin to hurt his feet. Having been picked green, they have rubbed his toes until he has corns upon them. So when they reach the porch, the king asks, my friend, what is good for corns? Tight boots, replied the dog, laughing, but they are not very good for your feet. How Prince Zingle was punished. Tom's for the tummy. What's a prince to do when his father, the king, reserves all the ice cream given by the cow with the golden horns for himself and the queen? Well, on the advice of the purple dragon, the prince pushes his father down a deep hole by the peanut trees. As Martin Gardner recalls with amusement, when the king found himself at the bottom of the hole, a happy idea came into his head. So he took hold of the hole and everything and effort, exerting all his strength, turned the hole upside down. Being now at the top, he stepped upon the ground and walked back to the palace where he caught Prince Zingle milking the cow with the golden horns. Locking the prince away while he considers an appropriate chastisement, the king consults the wise donkey. The donkey has not always been wise, but one Friday afternoon, just as school was letting out, the stupid donkey strayed into the schoolhouse where he was locked in for the weekend. Getting very hungry, the donkey discovered all the books in the school library and ate them. You can readily understand that after he had digested all this knowledge, he became very wise. The donkey re recommends a punishment of stomach ache. So the king rose Prince Zingle to the Fruitcake Island in Root Beer River, where soon the prince's overindulgence Reaches him, uh, teaches him to change his ways, and his father rescues him. Being a kind parent, he feeds his suffering son a blossom from a medicine tree, which quickly relieves his pain and leads him to appreciate the pleasure of repentance. 
the ruby casket baiting the hook. On a special celebration of the king's birthday, three or more such occasions occur each year as no one can remember the actual date of the king's birthday, the king opens the ruby casket, a present given to him long before by the sorceress Mayetta. Whenever it is opened, it presents charming things that no one in Funnyland has seen before. In this tale, we encounter a miniature German band, two green frogs, and a miniature elephant the size of a mouse. To continue the celebration, the celebrants go skating on Crystal Lake, which is composed of sugar syrup, with its surface candied by the sun to be as smooth as ice. Alas, the Princess Truella breaks through the ice and sinks along with Prince Jollikin and the King's Royal Chamberlain, Nuff said. The wise donkey advises the king to bait a hook with the favorite thing of each of these who sank. Each takes the bait and is pulled to safety to the surface. The cast iron man, rust not, want not. Winked King Skowliow rules across the mountains at the north of the Valley of Funnyland. His people live in caves and mines and, big, uh, and dig iron and tin out of the rocks, melting them into bars which are sold for money. Because the people of Funnyland care nothing for money, King Skowliow hates them. Fearing the sharp swords that grow on the trees of Funnyland, the vengeful King Skowliow has long avoided entering their kingdom, but finally he thinks of a plan. He puts all his mechanics to work and builds a great man out of cast iron with machinery inside him. When he is wound up, the cast iron man can roar and roll his eyes and gnash his teeth and march across the valley, crushing trees and houses to the earth as he goes. For the cast iron man is as tall as a church and as heavy as iron can make him, and each of his feet is as big as a barn. Indeed, the entire valley would soon be destroyed except that the cast iron man stubs his toe against the dog and falls flat on his face where he lies roaring and gnashing his teeth, but unable to do any further harm. By tickling the fallen giant with a feather, the funny lenders help right him and face him back toward the kingdom of Scaliao. The, there, then they prod him with a pin and the Iron Man walks back into the kingdom of Scaliao, destroying it before finally reaching the sea where he sinks to the bottom. Tim Tom and the Princess Patty Cake. Temper, temper. A tale much in the tradition of those collected by the Brothers Grimm. Tim Tom, smitten with the incredible beauty of the Princess Patty Cake, who has an unbridled, ferocious temper, seeks help from the sorceress Mayetta. In his quest to Mayetta's forest, at several obstacles, he seeks help, promising each helper that he will ask Mayetta to replace something that helper most wants, a missing eye for a black spider, a new song for a bird, and so forth. At the entrance to the dark forest, of Mayetta, he is confronted by a ferocious lion and a snarling tiger. He, his good fortune causes him to fall to the ground just as the beasts launch themselves at him. In their mid-air collision, they ferociously devour each other. Mayetta's castle proves to be a pure white marble and is very big and beautiful. It stands in a lovely garden filled with blue roses and pink buttercups where fountains of gold spout showers of diamonds and rubies and emeralds and amethysts, all of which sparkle in the sun so gorgeously that it makes Tim Tom's eyes ache just to look at them. Mayetta provides Tim Tom with four talismans, and despite initially losing them, he recovers them in the nick of time. Wisely, Tim Tom has tied up the anti-temper pill in his kerchief and has kept it safe all along. Finally, back at the castle, when Princess Patty Cake begins yelling at him, Tim Tom pops the pill down Patty Cake's throat, which relieves, of her, relieves her of her malignant temper and permits them to live happily ever after. How Prince Jollikin Fought the Jigaboo. The Jigaboo's body is round as a turtle's and on its back is a thick shell. From the center of the body rises a, ne a long neck much like that of a goose, with a most horrible-looking head perched on the top of it. 
This head is round as a ball and has four mouths on the side of it, and seven eyes set in a circle and projecting several inches above the head. The jigaboo walks on ten short but thick legs, and in front of its body are two long arms tipped with claws like those of a lobster. So sharp and strong are these claws that the creature should pinch a, could pinch a tree in two easily. Its eyes are remarkably bright and glittering, one being red in color, another green, and the others yellow, blue, black, purple, and crimson. Initially, Pinch Jollican, the only resident of Funnyland willing to challenge the monster's jigaboo, suffers badly. For one by one, his arms, his legs, and his head are cut off by the jigaboo's claws. But, as no one in Funnyland can die, as soon as the head has stopped rolling, it begins to whistle a popular tune. One by one, the legs come bounding to the head, which instructs them to put it on top of them, and a bodiless Jollican goes in search of the rest of him. Soon re reassembled, Jollican climbs a tree, and when the jigaboo wanders under him, Jollican swiftly decapitates it. Now a national hero, nevertheless, Jollican does not escape some inconvenience. For, as the result of his adventure, he finds himself very stiff in the joints for several days after the fight with the Jigaboo. It's now 11.02. Do you want me to truncate this and get us caught up? So I, I'll walk through the rest of the images without comment, comment, comment until we get to the last one. Truella's toe has been stolen by the wicked wizard by a raven, and she goes in quest of returning it. And uh, the color plates, as you have seen, are quite elegant and quite striking in their unusual design and their color scheme. A Visit to Turvyland was one of Martin Gardner's favorite chapters. It, uh, has, it's a world that has things upside down, houses on their roofs, trees with their branches down and their roots up and so forth. And the visitor is the Duchess Bread and Butter. They walk on their hands in that kingdom. She's there for a short while and then gets tired of it and goes back on the Root Beer River to be returned to Funnyland. Prince Fiddle Come Do and the Giant. The prince is a fiddler, hence his name. He decides to pick a bicycle and go for a ride into the next valley, which has a giant in it. Uh, one of the most elegant of the color plates, I think this one is. And he has a misfortune there. It's not that the giant and his wife are unfriendly, but she is washing the clothes and accidentally puts him through the clothes wringer, squashing him flat. So the wise donkey suggests to his father that they blow him up with the bicycle pump. And they reinflate him. He's back to normal, more or less. And then over the years, as he eats heavily, he fills his uh, swollen body until he's once again solid flesh. The civilized monkeys, I think of it as being a precursor to um, Planet of the Apes. It is very much like that. Unfortunately, uh, the prince is never able to learn the language of the monkeys, nor can they learn his language. So he manages eventually to escape, and uh, he got there by kite, so he puts his kite way up at the top of a tree and is blown back into funny land. The fate of the wise men. Someone has been eating all of the plum puddings off of the trees, and the king asks the wise men who the culprit is. First, they blame the fox, but he has a perfect alibi and is released. Then they blame the uh, hen. She had a perfect alibi. And then they blame a frog, who also had a perfect alibi. The fate of the wise men isn't so fortunate. The king is tired of them, grinds them up in mincemeat, <laughs> forms them into a new figure, bakes him, and out comes a truly wise man, who suggests that the actual culprit is the purple dragon. The ends of the purple dragon. Martin Gardner sums up the dramatic and humorous conclusion of A New Wonderland thus. In the end, the purple dragon was destroyed by stretching him so thin that he can be cut up into fiddle strings with excellent tones. <laughs> 
Our brief excursion through L. Frank Baum's New Wonderland provides an impression of his earliest work in writing for children. The book has whimsy, broad humor, surprising situations, and remarkable characters, but overall it lacks cohesion, and we can sense that there is really very little to connect one tale to another. What seems to be wanting is a sympathetic, motivated character to draw things together so that the book can have a focused narrative plot. We can be grateful that four years after the book's initial copyright of 1896, Baum had indeed found his way to producing just such a full-length narrative fantasy novel centered on a solid, plain-spoken child from Kansas, Dorothy, in what became his American classic, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz.